So it's my pleasure uh, to start with our third book club event. Um, and we'll be discussing, as I said, the novel, Why Fish Don't Exist by Lulu Miller. Um, we're so glad you have joined us for this discussion. And I promise you that you are in for a very special treat. Um, joining us uh, to discuss the book is the author, Lulu Miller, and her dad, Chris, who I will introduce more thoroughly before she gives us a little presentation. Um, we would love for this conversation to be interactive. So please send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, and we will address these during the Q&A session um, that follows the, the talk by Lulu. Um, to ask a question, simply click on the Q&A box or Q&A link um, and type your query into the question box um, located on the right side of your screen. We'll try to address as many of these questions as we can during our Q&A session. Please remember to tell us where you're joining us from so that we can give your location a mention as well. Um, the we this webinar will be archived on the Scientist website, as they all are, and we will send you a link uh, via email within a couple of days. So with that, uh, let me introduce our speakers, L our speakers. <laughs> and there they are. <laughs> So Lulu Miller, currently being consumed <laughs> by an anglerfish, <laughs> um, is the co-host of Radio Lab, um, co-founder of NPR's Invisibilia, and author of Why Fish Don't Exist. Her writing has been published in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, VQR, Orion, and other places. She has won honors from the Peabody Awards, the Associated Press, and the National Center on Disability and Journalism. Lulu's dad, Chris Miller, um, is a professor emeritus of biochemistry at Brandeis University, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, and a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. He studies the structure and mechani mechanism of ion channels and transporters, and his research group's work has been published in hundreds of scientific papers. And I should mention that Lulu is joining us from um, the Andersonville neighborhood in Chicago, Illinois. And her dad, Chris, is joining us from Newton, Massachusetts, the childhood home of Lulu. Um, so welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us. And with that, Lulu is going to give us her brief spiel with real-time reaction from her dad before we get into the conversation. Great. Well, Bob, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you all for coming on a Friday, hanging out, talking about a weird book. Uh, which is kind of a novel, but I would just insert the one letter, I'd call it a non-vol, like it's a non-fiction novel. Um, it, it does all happen to be true. Um, and yeah, I just, as I was talking with Bob in preparation um, for today, I, I said a couple things to him about this sort of dubious pursuit of um, mixing a quest for meaning with the scientific worldview um, and turning to science for, for moral instruction and how that's played out in my life. And he thought maybe some of that would be interesting to share here. Um, and that has to do with why I have brought my lovely father here with me today, Chris Miller. Um, first of all, just because he's fun, you should ask him anything, throw your questions, he's great. Um, and uh, obviously he's a huge part of the book um but also yeah i i think you know you should always lower expectations look you always lower okay okay he's no fun he's at horrible the he's, dry, he's stale he's defensive he's cagey okay <laughs> all right there we go um but uh yeah and so you know this one of the questions that sometimes comes up with the book is like why are these two stories intertwined you're your emotional emo struggle for meaning and then this random guy from the 1800s you know what are they doing together how did they come together um and and i blame i blame you father dear for this this sort of unfortunate dubious mixing of things um because as i as i sort of explain clearly in the book in the middle of, of chapter three um you know, my dad sort of ruled our home with his iron fist of the scientific worldview. Um, and I talk about how like <laughs> at an early age, you know, he was he was spoon feeding nihilism and atheism into our big questions and into our childhood from the beginning. Um, and one of the scenes I share in the book is sort of turning to him with this big, what does it all mean question? And him essentially like tap dancing away. It means nothing, there's no point, there's no plan. 
there's no meaning, we're just here for a moment, you're soon to die, you were made by chaos, the universe doesn't care for you, do you want to bite a bagel? Like it was just, okay. Um, and that haunted me in certain ways. Uh, but the other thing, which I didn't, I think, talk about enough in the book, um, was that the scientific worldview was also so dazzling. Um, and I would go to him all the time with big questions that were actually met with um, what felt like a complete explanation. You know, hearing him even talk about how a tree makes its wood out of the air, like his voice will crack, he still gets excited. And, and so I think a lot of the time I would turn to him for big questions, he would give me a scientific answer and I would feel completely satiated and I'd, and I'd feel tickled and warmed. And, and a lot of the time that, that really, the scientific worldview was very satisfying and warming. Um, and so I think at a certain point, I just kind of became wired to turn to science for potentially almost inappropriate questions, like philosophical, moral questions. I would, I would go to science and I blame him for that, for talking in such a great way about it and talking expansively. Um, and that sort of hugely formed my trajectory just as a person. I was, you know, I had graduated from college and was really interested in telling stories and actually writing fiction and sort of fantastical things. And it was that first year when I was out of college that I heard the show Radio Lab. Um, and that just popped out of the air. You know, it was one of the first shows playing with digital editing, adding music to stories, um, and turning again to, to science to ask these huge philosophical questions. And that show was so, it was everything I wanted back then. It would, you know, it looked to fireflies to gesture at the idea that there might be interconnectedness and emergence. It looked to baboons to show, oh, there maybe altruism is a part of us. And it, and it sort of put these big questions and went to sort of um, all the various disciplines of science to look for answers and handed back answers on a platter and I, and I loved that. Um, and so I slowly, you know, started to work for them and felt so lucky I got to end up there and worked my butt off to try to learn what I was doing. But after about five years, you know, I was sitting there, I was employed and a huge part of the job of being a journalist, um, you know, is actual reporting and going beyond the sort of philosophical question and then just crashing into reality and crashing into people and crashing into complexity. Um, and the more and more that I did that, the more and more uncomfortable I got with the work. I felt like I had a shyness. I felt like I lacked a certain journalistic training, a certain kind of confidence and backbone to even be able to push back in interviews. And so I, after about five years, there were a couple interviews that just were so intense. And I, I was like, I, I can't do this work. And I left and I went for a few years to kind of hide out in the world of fiction. And I, I got an MFA in fiction writing. Everyone thought I was crazy. Like go study the highly lucrative <laughs> trade of fiction writing. Uh, people were concerned for my mental health as they periodically are. Uh, but, but, you know, and that was, that was, that was really, um, it was in certain ways a great time, but it was also the time in my life where other things started to fall apart and I felt really lost. And so this is kind of the genesis of the book. This is where I, again, now in my late 20s, what do I do? I'm lost, I need moral instruction. Specifically, I'm wondering, and this is so embarrassing to say out loud, but this was the genesis of the book. You know, in interviews, I try to talk about like, oh, it's about taxonomy and when the quest for order becomes madness and the interesting evolution in the psychotherapeutic community of concepts like positive illusions. Okay, the book was like started because I got dumped uh, because I cheated on my boyfriend and I wanted him back and I was hoping he would come back and years and years went by and I began to wonder about the nature of hope and faith and I had all this hope but I could see nothing was changing and and literally I just wondered is there a way to know if you have the good kind of hope that will allow you to prevail and is noble and you crusade against doubt or if you have the bad kind of hope that's like making you be deluded and leading you off a course to insanity. And that was my question, which is an inherently unanswerable question. I realized that there's not a definitive answer on hope or faith. Like that's the whole, the substance of it is you can't know. And it's always a guess and it's always a bid and it's always a risk and it's a calculation and it plays out in all kinds of different realms. But anyway, that was my question. 
which then I looked to science. I looked to David Starr Jordan, this guy who resonated with me for my own silly, personal, subjective, icky <laughs> reasons. But I wondered if his scientific work, his relentless persistence um, in the face of the earthquake and the fire and the, the lightning, you know, I wondered how his story ended. And I wondered if someone so brazen, you know, did he end up a fool or did he end up successful? That was my, again, flawed, subjective, moral, almost silly question that I went in uh, to, to try to find an answer to. And um, and then that, that quest, you know, it took me years to, to find out the answers. And along the way, I think obviously what happened is, is that at a certain point, enough of the work, enough sort of research and archive diving and talking to people you know, the premise for the book, it broke out of the parable, or I hope, I hope it did for you as readers. There's a point in the book where um, it doesn't matter the answer because the question led me to these people and led me to people like Anna and Mary who had been so personally affected by the kinds of ideas about eugenics that David Starr Jordan put in place and led me down these other wormholes that showed just how alive the the eugenics, you know, the legacy of eugenics is in our law today still and in so many places. Um, and, you know, led me to these places that I would have never ended up if I just hadn't had this embarrassing, almost it feels sinful to admit to a room full of science adjacent people. But that's that's where it started, but it is. Um, and And I think I guess the question that I sort of I put to the room and that that I also kind of put to my dad is, you know, how do we negotiate these these things being in relation to each other? Because I know so much of the work of science is to move forward and try to be as objective as we can be. But is it better to admit that we all have these biases and these personal drives for meaning? Do we just try to vanquish them from ourselves and eradicate them? Or do we say they're here and let's look about them and talk about them and treat them as even objects worthy of study, you know, influencing our work? And yeah, I think that's, I guess that's a question that, that I have for you, dad, like, do those, do you feel those battling out in you? What, how do you make sense of, what to do with the sort of embarrassing personal meaning making drives that actually are a part of us. Do you just try to get them out of your work entirely? Do you believe you can? You're asking me? I'm asking you. Me? You, Mr. Objectivity. I, I don't think about that much. <laughs> Really? <laughs> I, it's not something that worries me. But it doesn't worry you that how your hunch or your biases might inherently be immediately cutting off the kinds of questions you're even asking or, or what you're even looking at. Like, it doesn't, yeah. aren't they in a certain way negative? You know, in in research, doing scientific research, you you have to both cherish your biases, and you have to be able to put them to the side and not be attached to them. Mm -hmm. You need you need them you need them very much because there's a lot that happens because of intuition and and and. Uh, sort of random accident, but of course, no scientist can be driven by, by its biases. You, but, um, so I, I don't know if that's answering your question, actually. I, I, I just, when you uh, say cherish, what do you mean by cherish? Well, I, my experience is that a lot of, good discovery that those those rare and wonderful moments that come in the process of research where you suddenly see something new that 
that those things would not have happened without your being led to some extent by your own biases, by your own bias of just what direction do you want to look down because, because you just like it, because you just like that direction or it just appeals to you, not for any, you know, analytical reasons. So that's what I mean by cherishing your biases, that I really do believe that just in the process of scientific discovery, what you like is really important mm -hmm. as, a, as a way of leading you. But then what you're often going to find, if you are so lucky to have actually made a discovery that, that's just so surprising, is that it usually doesn't turn out at all the way you anticipated it would. But the aesthetic, the, the, the aesthetic drive is still there. Yeah. You said it to me once. You said the hunch is what gets you out the door and yeah. the discovery is wilder than what you can imagine. And I, I do, I do, t I, I appreciate that where it's like, we can't always, we can't take away our intuition like that, right. that we can't, you know, we, maybe we just accept that that's our engine. That's our rudder. That's what steers mm -hmm. us and gets us going. And then, and then our job is to be, present in the world with what we find and be ready to, to, you know, let go of beliefs at all times. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then I guess the, the sort of the third sort of secret character in the book is, is science itself. And I think how, how the science changes through David Starr Jordan's life and beyond, you know, how he, how it moves from this. Yeah worldview of the divine plan and then him letting go of that and embracing Darwin, but then the ways in which he kind of links them and then the ways in which cladistics comes on the scene, you know, year posthumously kind of, um, and, and eugenics, of course, looking like something that was scientifically sound, masquerading as a scientifically sound idea is showing up in university textbooks and curriculum all across the country, um, which again, you know, is sort of beliefs cloaked by science and then given this immunity of, of objectivity of supposed objectivity and i think for me one of the little ending points is that <laughs> i in no way lost have lost faith in science at all especially in like this era i don't want to say anything close to that but i think i just came to see how muddy with with humanity it is and i think as a little girl I was such a disciple to you and to the scientific worldview that I just thought science is truth. It's a study, it's truth. There we go, we found out the truth. And now I think it's, you know, just realizing that there are many places to search for truth. And that felt forbidden to me when I was a little girl. Like I, I, I it really did. And, and I think realizing that, you know, science doesn't have a monopoly on truth is, has been important. That's been my slow, my slow growing, very slow growing experience of, of learning, like there are places you need to reality test that. All right. Well, thank you so much. Lou. I hate to cut you guys off, but I no do worries. want to, have time to get to questions. Um, yeah. And just to remind the viewers, if you do have a question, um, you can ask it at any time using that Q&A tab on the right side of your screen. Um, I'm going to invoke the moderator's privilege, as I typically do, and start <laughs> start us off. And I realized that that questions about this book and about your relationship with your dad, it can take many forms. Like, uh, you know, we can talk about science, we can talk about philosophy, we can talk about the actual writing of your book. I wanna start with some kind of personal questions, if you don't mind. Um, and the first one is to you, Chris, and it, and it comes from me as kind of like a scientifically minded father myself. Um, and certainly what Lulu was saying about seeing beauty and seeing magic and seeing mystery in the scientific explanation of our physical universe, I, I get that. Like, like, you don't have to convince me of that. But what I think is interesting is that no matter what culture you're a part of, it's almost universal that there are certain like delusions that we give to children. Some of them are pleasant, you know, at least in their intention, some of them not so pleasant. But I'm wondering if you as a father struggled with that in, in raising your children, or if it was just like, nope, I'm going to give them the straight scientific dope and that's it. Well, 
Okay, I wouldn't. Okay, yeah, no. So I have not. I did not, as a dad of three daughter, little daughters, I didn't struggle at all with this issue of of uh, well, you're saying of 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 answering their questions in a way that I thought was just just represented my own view. Uh, you know, as soon as they got to the age, say, beyond which they believed in Santa Claus, you know, I thought uh, that it, uh, it, it, uh, if they would ask me a question, and, and I have to say, the, the, the event that Lulu described in her chapter three, standing on the deck at Cape Cod and looking over out towards Cape Cod Bay, and then just coming up with this fundamental question about life and the universe. I, I had not struggled with that previously, and I didn't struggle with it at the time, and I almost didn't think about my answer. It was just spontaneous. Was, she asked me what I felt about that, what, what's the point of anything, and I told her I didn't think there was any point. It just came out. Um, so there was no struggle. I suppose looking back on it now, I mean, in the light of having read Lula's book, which was a huge um, enlightenment for me, I, I never realized that an answer like that would be anything but comforting, <laughs> which is what it was for me. I mean, that view of life. I think there is some grandeur, as they say, in this view of life. And, and uh, it was purposelessness of the universe, speck on a speck on a speck, as Lulu quotes uh, Tyson in her book. That is a comforting thought for me. And I thought it would just be comforting for anyone who, you know, was clued into it. Yeah. Well, no, that's great. I think I think it's great that you mentioned specific episodes in the book because that brings me to my next question. And really, it's for you, Lulu. When writing a book that's so personal um, and so kind of revelatory, and you talk about your childhood, you talk about your thought process, the struggles that you had. Was there a specific part of the book that, for you, were that like maybe gave you some pause to say, like, I'm writing about this, but like, uh, I don't know if I should put that out there. And then the corollary question to, to you, Chris, is. Was there a part of the book that was particularly hard for you to read or particularly like like eye-opening for you to read? I mean, yeah, I'll go first real quick. But yeah, I mean, the so in the book proposal, oh, almost none of the personal stuff was in there. There was a little bit about having a godless upbringing and sort of turning to David Star Jordan to make meaning because that was so the engine of the book for me. So like that was there. But nothing else, and I'd written a partial draft of it that I had started to write an essay and then it spiraled into like 60 pages. And I was like, oh, this might be a little book. And, and so I, I pitched that basically. And none of the none of the suicide attempt, cheating on my boyfriend, like my biggest secret shames, none of that was in there. I can tell you that. And I didn't think any of that was going in there. Um, and it wasn't in the first draft. And then I you know, talked with my editor I mean, you know, so there are like, there's some nice parts here and there's some interesting questions, but like, what, like, why are you so obsessed with this guy? What is the connection? And he just kind of encouraged me to do some free writing around that. And then I did, and then I did. And I like answered that question honestly. And I turned in some pages where I was like, may we possibly never share these with the world, but I really trusted him. John Cox, he's incredible. Um, and yeah, and then we just kind of slowly sat with them. And and I think time, you know, humans have the ability to adjust to anything. I think with time, I thought about, okay, maybe this can be in there. And then economy of words is really important to me. And I just, I was like, if it's gonna be in there, I don't wanna linger in it. Like I can be honest, but I, it's, it's maybe it's gonna be like 250 words, you know, like I don't want it. It is smeared all over the book, but actually in terms of words, it's not, it's very quick. Um, and so I literally chose every word that was in there because I didn't want to linger in it. Um, but yeah, the, for me, the hardest part, honestly harder than the, the depression and the mental health struggle stuff was the cheating. Like that was my 
biggest shame, my biggest secret. And um, it, it felt like, oh, putting that out there, having to show my mother, my now mother-in-law, like that I was a person who had cheated, would that cause her to worry that I could cheat? Like I had a lot of baggage around that. That was really hard to get over. Um, but has been interesting. Like they, they do say, you know, that shame, like, you know, truth will set you free. And it, it has been, it's been interesting to see how just putting it out there has been so much less scary than my worst fears. So yeah. that, that's my end. Yeah. And how about you, Chris? What was, the, what was maybe the hardest part of the book for you to read? For the hard, hard, there were no hard parts to read. I was swirled into this world of Lulu's, but the hard thing for me coming out of having read the book was realizing how clueless I was as a parent in my view of Lulu in a way. I, I think, you know, one of the most, as parents, we have a couple of very important jobs to do. And one is to know our children to know them, to know them intimately, to, to be able to know how they are. And I always, you know, I always viewed Lulu really from her infancy because personality does start showing up awfully, awfully early. Anyone who has kids knows that. Um, as a basically happy, secure, fun-loving, and, uh, and, and very, uh, very, sort of wild and creative kid in that those were all things that made me feel very you know, uh, good about her and of course good about myself as a father. And yes, of course, in her adolescence, I knew that she had some dark clouds, but you know, we all have dark clouds in our adolescence. And I didn't think it, I didn't think these were what was hard is realizing how unhappy Lulu was at times when I thought she was just, you know, this fun-loving child. Uh, well, that's that, tough. I that was tough, but it wasn't tough to read that book. It was tough to realize that how much I had missed as a as a father of of a young child and as of, a, as of a teenager. I mean, we expect to miss a lot of our teenager, thank God we <laughs> miss a lot of it. But, uh, you know, <laughs> as a father of a young child, especially. Yeah, well, that's what I was gonna say. That's probably pretty universal. I think most parents probably miss a lot of what's going on in their children's internal world. So in that sense, you're lucky because your child wrote a book and explained it. And you got to have it. I, don't, I don't know if anyone would be feels lucky. I will also say, I mean, I think it's not missing. Like I was hiding it, you know. I think a, a helpful thing in my life, a lot of the time I was trying to imitate your jaunty way, sarcastic, you know, like I wanted to, and, and I think as tons of research shows, you know, the whole CBT method in psych, like there is some power and some truth to faking it. And I think a lot, I think, I think that I was trying to, to hide it. You weren't, you weren't missing very clear clues. And I was trying to jump out of it too. And I feel grateful for that, 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 um, I don't want you to feel any guilt about that. I should have thought about it. I don't feel guilt, I just feel clueless. I just feel clueless, mm. not guilty. Yeah. Good. Okay, good, good, good. good with awesome. Well, I want to get to some viewer questions. We have quite a few. So this one comes to us from Ellen Werner at the NIH um, in Bethesda. Um, and Ellen asks, I listened to the audio audiobook and really enjoyed the personal quest integrated with science history. Um, can you, Lulu, share any anecdotes from the interviews and archives that were not in the book? Oh. oh. Yes. Okay. Oh, asking me about cutting room floor. Um, okay. So this one was a favorite. Okay. So David Starr Jordan, as you now know him, very skeptical, prides himself on being a skeptic. 
kind of had all these satires about, you know, what he called psyosophy, basically making fun of what I was doing in the book, the mixing of science and philosophy. Um, and he wrote this whole, it's like this story that's an entire microcosm. I'm gonna do it in one minute, okay. So he wrote a satire called The Simp Psychograph about a future, and this is in like early, eight, late 1800s, about a camera that could take pictures of thoughts and of the brain, basically. So in certain ways, he's like imagining an fMRI. Okay, but and in his vision, so he writes this satire, and in the vision, the way the sim psychograph works is it's seven cameras poised around a person who then has to think, and then like the cameras use, you know, what does he call it, odic emanations, and, and, and it can capture like the pure thought of a cat. And so he, and, and he's like, we've, we've captured this. And he got his friend who was a photographer to make a doctored like kind of image of a blurry cat from three angles. And he publishes it in, I believe it was in Science um, or, may, or maybe a different one, but he, he publishes it as satire and with the photo and it, it ends with the line. Um, and now his next, this fictional character's next line of study he wants to examine a cat's thought of a man. <laughs> and um, and then he went on some trip to like, to, to actually to the Arctic, which ended up in, again, complicated human. He did really passionate work to protect seals from the, you know, sealing industry. And he was doing that work. So he was gone for many months. He comes back and he has all these letters of people who want to interview him about the real science. And they want to book him to talk about this incredible science and he got so angry that people missed the point that it was a joke that he wrote this he didn't apologize oh and then so science issued a they got so many letters that they issued an apology and he got angry at them he's like how dare you apologize the public is at fault for believing this this is the source of all evil like a a, a malleable brain this this susceptible to flights of fancy and then he wrote like a rebuttal to like a non-apology. He's like, they apologize. I don't apologize. It's your fault, reader. And then anyway, and so this whole thing, and he, um, and he had a line that was basically like a public this willing to believe, having this much hunger to believe in being able to see a thought is like a dangerous, I'm butchering it. But you know, he said, this is, this is like, this is the, the source of all suffering in society. Flash forward, so I think of this whole story as like he pre-predicted the fMRI crisis that came out a few years ago where there was this glitch in the software that rendered, um, oh, and he called it oh, physics, impressionistic physics. And and this sort of, um, this, this there was this big glitch in the software, but likely you know about this, and where something like 70% or a huge amount of research from this one fMRI company um, was just, it was, it was spitting out bad results. And so, you know, and it found like, for instance, thought activity patterns in a dead salmon, which just to be clear is a salmon that was dead. So like this glitch, it wasn't that the scientists were engaging in fraud or sloppy science. It was just that the, the machine was giving them false readings. And then they were overlaying all this meaning on it. And, and, um, again, I'm not quite doing it justice, but that whole story I felt like was this microcosm of, he was this skeptic who reluctantly became an oracle and predicted this, like he, he invented the machine before it existed. And then also like the story showed how susceptible we are. We wanna believe the brain is that, you know, that like that we could deconstruct it and see it. And that desire maybe led us to misinterpret results. Anyway, so that was a favorite. I so didn't do it fast, I'm sorry. He, but, he, yeah. was, he was way ahead of his time in terms of fake news. Maybe we could put it. Oh, big time, big time. Um, well, great. So, so we have another question from Brent Hallahan, who's tuning in. Um, he asked, and this is kind of a question I had too. He asked, what should Jordan's legacy be? Um, and he asked about the renaming of buildings and things like that. And th this to me, I think you can extend this to Agassiz, um, to other characters in your book where you know they say never meet your heroes in this book you very much met your hero <laughs> and you uncovered some very very dark things about the way he thought the, the activities he was involved in so how do you feel about kind of jordan's legacy and especially i think just last year i think they started kind of removing his statues and renaming jordan hall at stanford and things like that what's your take on kind of what his final legacy should be i mean i think i think he 
is a human and he is best left as someone to look at really closely to be, I mean, he, he is responsible for some serious atrocities. Um, and yet I think what's more interesting rather than either deifying him or vilifying him is to understand his actions, like what made him do that and hold all, I think when we, if we just villainize him, he was bad from the beginning, you know, then we actually miss the kind of understanding that can help us all move forward and not make his mistakes. Um, and there's so much in his tale that, that looks like it should have led him in, in, the, in a good direction. Like he, he wrote these beautiful things about the necessity of doubt. Like he actually, he had the groundwork there, trust nature, not books. Like he, and yet for a person like that to still go so astray. And he, you know, he believed in, um, he believed in integration in the schools. He, he, he like protected species. He did do some good things, but, and so I think what, I and mean, in terms of his legacy in particular on the buildings, like I, in certain ways, I'm, I'm agnostic about what to do on a case by case situation. But I think coming to some sort of contextualization, if you're not going to take the name down, like is erasing the right call? Like, could we keep it up with a huge sign and a spotlight on the sign that like tells us who made our campus and, and and have an annual festival where you have to deal with it? I mean, I don't know. Like, I think we should contextualize it and I think we should educate. Um, but I, I am really fascinated uh, to keep looking. Yeah, like I'm just interested in in how how it went wrong and, and, and continuing to look at all the strands. Um, another mm -hmm. thing really quick. For, for Ellen that I just want to throw in, which comes into this, he was a he was a witness in the Scopes trial. I didn't even go into that in the book because like this guy was the Forrest Gump of this era. I mean, he is everywhere, presidents, letters from presidents. But anyway, so that's another one. And it's like looking at that trial and seeing how our ideas of good and bad have changed over time and who was fighting for what. I just, I think it's interesting to see him fully and give people as much access to Mm -hmm. all of his you know beliefs and choices as we can to try to take try to take instruction for ourselves yeah and, and i'm curious like is that is that measured kind of a approach reflected in your own personal connection to david star jordan because i mean at least the way it's laid out well, he's pretty icky i think he's pretty icky but yeah because i, I mean in the beginning you looked to him as kind of a lodestar right like he was going to be your guide through this tough time in your life and, and show you how to hope maybe but then I assume it was later on you learned about the kind of the eugenics and the darker side of his, of his legacy. So yeah. have you come to a place where you can kind of take the good with the bad or is he just icky to you? He, he's pretty darn icky. Like I would, I would hope never to be like him. And yet I think in an odd way, because of when the book hit the world, it was shortly after everything shut down last year, it's early April. And I was, you know, we were all reeling with just what's happening and so much unknown and so much chaos. And the thing I ended up, I surprised myself is occasionally I would think, how would he respond to this moment? He wouldn't linger. He wouldn't be sad about everything he lost. Like I'm moaning about, I didn't get to go on a book tour. I've been dreaming of writing a book for my whole life, but I you don't get, I've never signed anyone's book. You know, I'm moaning about that stuff. and. He wouldn't do that. Like he would just innovate immediately. Okay, an earthquake comes. Let me bring out the needle and and up up the way that I attached my knowledge to the specimen. Like he he didn't spend a lot of time brooding and looking backwards. And and I think that if you use that for good, I mean, in certain ways, that's he didn't reflect much, so he didn't think about who he was hurting, and that's bad. But like, how could I steal some of his tricks to hopefully use? for a better, you know, to use for something good. I, I do think he has, I mean, he's got skills that like the rest of us could steal and hopefully use for, for good. There are things to learn from him, I think. Yeah. yeah. Bob, can I ask a very quick yes or no question? A yeah. follow up to yours. Uh -huh. uh, Lulu, do you think he was a murderer? Did he kill <laughs> him? I am going to say, I truly don't know. Like, I just don't know. And I, I think that, you know, in some ways my, my lust for narrative would make me 
oh, it would be so great if he, if he was, and there's a lot that's there, and there are a lot of, there actually are a lot of people who feel convinced he was. But then I've talked to other people who say, well, you know, Bertha the maid maybe had motive. She was there both poisoning. She, would she stand to get an inheritance? Maybe it was just he lucked out. I, I think his. I think he covered up her murder. I, I do. I am very convinced that he covered up that she was murdered. I'm. I'm very convinced she was murdered, like almost completely convinced. Um, and I think I'm very convinced he worked very arduously to cover it up. And that's creepy. Did he do it? I. I still don't know. But I will say this. What do you think? Well, well, well I will say this. Richard White who is the Stanford historian who taught that amazing class where he had his students on the archives. He is so great, by the way. But he uh, he's, he told me recently that he's like been continuing looking into the murder in particular. And all he said, and I think he's gonna write a whole book on it, which everyone should read, because it'll be amazing. Um, but he said, it's not looking good for Jordan. <laughs> so. I thought he was the guy who originally said, "Oh, it could have been Bertha." Let's be let's be sober historians about this. But now he, so that's all I got. I don't know. I don't know. Do you think he did? I won't say, but I have been trying to get a yes or no answer out of you for the last year. About that. <laughs> Still, are not coming up with one. Yeah, I'm not being coy. You like, mean, don't you know. mean, raising ambiguity. No, but it's not just that. It's like the frustration of historical, I mean, or any, I mean, or, or, or living cases. Like there is an element of unknowability and I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I want to go through a question from Melissa Gold, who is a science librarian at Millersville University in Pennsylvania. Beautiful Millersville. Um, and Melissa asks, did David Starr Jordan know that fish don't exist? Um, and how do you think he would have dealt with that knowledge? I don't think that he, that he, that I don't believe, unless he was, I mean, he was a great scientific thinker. So there's a chance that maybe he realized the same, the same idea that I talk about in the book that, you know, that it's basically a, a gerrymandered class of creatures. Um, there's a chance, but, but it did feel like this discovery that, the Claytis came forward with in the 80s and that to my understanding really revolutionized the field of ichthyology. So my guess would be that he hadn't quite perceived it yet or again, didn't have the words for it. Like maybe he, I don't know, maybe I don't, I actually don't know. And I have, I have had that thought of if someone was looking that closely, would he not have seen the the differences and the you know the same kinds of like this the structural similarities between a lungfish and a mammal like would I don't know so I don't know I I like to believe that he actually would have come to accept it um again as someone who liked I mean obviously we see him go horribly awry um and and dig into his certainty when it came to eugenics against all counter evidence but I like to think that similarly, as he let go of the divine hierarchy and became, you know, believed in Darwin, at least in his words, um, I kind of think if there was enough enough scientific evidence and enough people convincingly arguing the point, I think he would have let go of the fish. And I hold on to the hope that it would have really hurt his feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little retribution. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe he would have found it fascinating and written an article about it and loved it. I don't know. I don't know how he would have felt. But I do think he would have come to believe it. Yeah. All right. Um, we have another question from Jamie Green. Um, and Jamie says, your book seems like a new way of mixing non nonfiction with uh, science elucidating writing, science elucidating writing with personal narrative, where it went primarily primarily back to you, the author, rather than the typical route of looking for a personal example in the world. How did you and your editing team reach the conclusion to pursue this new style? Um, and was there a moment when it just suddenly kind of made sense? It, yeah, again, it was just so iterative. I think it was kind of what I was feeling about ineloquently at the beginning is that I think the personal motivations were what was pushing me toward the research the obsessive research, like I, I was, I was hooked on finding stuff out, um, 
And then I, I turned in that first draft and my editor just didn't get the, the connections I, were, I was making because they were intuitive to me. And he was like, I need you to just explicitly, I need you to articulate this. And I was like, well, obviously, you know, there were, and I, so for me, it was that process of his confusion, me being forced to articulate really embarrassing personal things dialing it back till I got it to a, an amount and a wording that I felt okay about. And I don't know. I mean, I think, yeah, that like, that's the best I can say. It was that it was with, it was this sort of partnering crime with my editor iterative process of, of kind of pushing and pulling. Um, hmm. And there'd be moments where I'm like, I can't say that that's too obvious. And he's like, no, we need it. It, it makes it snap together. And so we just, we had many battles that I that I, I think that's that's what what got it there. Um, but again, I think the parts of the book I'm most proud of are like, or where I learned the most was where it finally leapt out of that premise, and when we started to meet other people like mm. like Anna and Mary, and and just trying to understand the the lay of the legal landscape in terms of eugenics, and trying to and Carol Kasich Ewan's story, and like. It, I think it's when I finally could look away from myself and my desire to cram him into a parable, sh per sorry, not parable, but parable shape. Um, it's kind of that third element is where it got exciting for me. Mm. Yeah. Um, so another question from the audience, this one is from Susan Jewett. Um, and Susan says, I'm an ichthyologist and have known him, David Starr Jordan, only as an ichthyologist. In your book, is the true history distinguishable from any fiction you may have incorporated? So the book is is all is is, a, is all true to my knowledge, and um, so I mean, there he actually he writes he writes some fiction. He wrote some children's stories, but the the sides of his you know of his life that I brought in outside of science are all there. I I got the whole book fact checked. And so that comes from a mix of archival research, other, there've been a few other books that have chapters about him. There was one biography written of him in the fifties that was very laudatory. So you have to like read him between the lines. Hmm. Um, but yeah, to, to the best of my knowledge and my really awesome fact checkers knowledge, all that, all that extra stuff about him, all of it's true. Okay. Um, so I think we're gonna take a philosophical turn now. Ooh. All right. And I thank, uh, I thank Douglas Oswald, who's tuning in um, for this next question. And then I'll have kind of some philosophical, philosophical follow-ups maybe. Um, but Douglas asked, was, was it, um, why is it that many general scientists outside the specialty of cl cladistics miss the importance of fish not existing as a category? What does this say about philosophical uh, or philosophy thinking or training in the sciences? Ooh. That's a great question. I mean, I think that speaks to something that if, if my mom might be out there somewhere that she has dedicated a lot of her latter part of her career to the idea of consilience and these like siloed expertises where, uh, you know, I, you know, I was so, pr I finally understood why fish didn't exist. That took me so many years of interviewing and scribbling. And then I went and talked to the main philosopher that I talked to in the book, Trenton Merricks, and I was like, fish don't exist. And he was like, yeah, of course they don't. Like he was not dazzled. He, 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 he's like, this is what I'm trying to teach my students. Like the, our categories are human constructed and, you know, and, and I think, I think if there was, you know, I don't know, like there's, you know, academia has all kinds of well-rounded training. It's not that there's no consilience, but how do we keep that consilience a part of our jobs as we age into like, adults in our fields and how do we talk to each other and um i think that you know there's also the the concept of jargon like a lot of the ichthyologists i talked to said oh yeah fish is a you know do fish exist i don't know i mean well it's a paraphilic category but and then and then they're comfortable with that term but not the next term and and i think it's kind of like the the role that words play in that and and it was really carol Kasich yoon's book which she put it into such beautiful terms. She talked about the death of the fish and she was a biologist and she spoke in these ways that were metaphorically inviting to me as a curious person, but an outsider to ichthyology. And so I do think it's sometimes just 
forcing people in different fields in a more um, paced out, like continuous way is, is, is something that we lack because we're busy and we all need to do things and that feels extracurricular or something. But I, I think it's just the natural siloization of mm. expertise. And, and I would love to think about ways to break that down. But I'm like any fields. Think about I. Oh, I just think about all the things I don't know about. You know, like, yeah. Dad, do you have thoughts? Well, I, it it also might be partly or largely because remember the cla the cladistics is a fairly recent uh, addition to taxonomy. But and forty it, years ago now. But that's fairly recent. Yeah, you know, like yeah. It is. It's a long time before that. Yeah. And and I I think that uh, and and there was a, as you have talked about in the book, there's a huge amount of pushback against a a, a, a way of organizing a taxa according to evolutionary uh, relationships, and uh, and there was a lot of uncertainty about what really were the evolutionary relationships before massive genome sequencing came along. Yeah. And it was really massive genome sequencing that makes us now very confident about what these phylogenetic trees look like. Yeah. And that we can just look at the tree and say, well, of course fish don't exist. You yeah. know, that there were indications that that occurred with your lungfish and the epiglottis and all of that. But um, I think it wasn't really until much more recently we had big DNA genomics coming in that we could be pretty confident about it. Yeah, and I, I love the, the scene in your book, Lulu, where you mention the perspective of the fisherman and you saying, hey, fish don't exist, and he like flops the salmon down <laughs> on the table. Uh, and to me, that really spoke to like perspectives, right? Because like we can we can have the scientific explanation and, and explain why fish don't exist and all, all the stuff you guys are talking about in terms of the evolutionary relationships and what may not be there based on intuition when you look at a harder source of data but perspective matters right so to a fisherman he doesn't care about this whole he or she doesn't care about this whole conversation because yeah. for them fish exist yeah so, so my question is are, is it is it in some way folly to position science as the lens through which we can see this ultimate general, uh, uh, like capital T truth. Mm. So, so I mean, so if you think about like early, early humans, for example, for them, okay, the evolution was still kind of like there and, and ongoing. And, and yes, the eventual reality of fish don't exist w was there at their time. But for them, fish meant things from the water that we can eat to survive. Or for an, an, an ant has its own truth that it pursues and uses to, to do the things it needs to do in life. So my question is, does subscribing to that idea that science as as exercised by human brains is the is the is the pathway to the ultimate truth? Isn't that just subscribing to this hierarchy to say our truth is the most important? I think yes. Like big claps on that. I think and that has been my very dense, slow headed like realization. I think part of writing the book was 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 realizing that. And that science itself is is like an art or science itself is a proxy. It's a great proxy. Like it it, it helps us do incredible things. It helps us understand incredible things. Um but at the end of the day, it's 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 about, you know, I think it's more like guesswork and ways of honestly exploiting the universe. Like it is about understanding, but where it lines up with reality is that it's about sort of getting the universe to, to help us. Or my, I don't know, Dad, you might argue with this, but I think it's about it's so linked to our utility and our and our ability to, you know, making sense of the world as a way of ranking value or whatever it may be um understanding math so that we can engineer buildings that stand up you know like it, it it's um i think the, that yes i think science is like another form of it's it's i think as long as we remember that it's a proxy and an incredibly useful one an incredibly powerful one but at the end of the day i do think it's it you know it is born of our eyes and brains so it, it is muddy with us and we are short-sighted in so many ways hmm. Chris? 
I will, always, I will always agree with Lulu's assertion that we are short-sighted. Yeah. Okay, good. I knew if I ended it there, I could get a yes. <laughs> you know how, yeah. All right. Well, I want to be mindful of time. We have a we have a ton of great questions that I haven't gotten to. Um, but Lulu, I think you had a question specifically for your dad that that we wanted to get to. Is that right? Oh yeah. This you can be. But just um. Okay. So one question I had for you was. Um. Did I do you? Okay. So one of the arguments, the big philosophical one of the arguments that I make in the book is this: what feels very daring and blasphemous to say, which is that sort of based on the dandelion principle, I believe that people matter. Mm -hmm. Did you roll your eyes at that? Oh, no. I mean, look, just because I don't think there's any grand meaning in the universe, doesn't mean that I don't think that, that it, it doesn't mean that I think that, that we, that other people and the way we interact with society doesn't matter. I mean, that's that's uh, essential for our uh, our existence, uh, our survival as a species, as a social species. You know, so no, no, the dandelion. I I, I had never heard that analogy before. Uh, the dandelion principle. You introduced. But I, I, I didn't have any objection to it. It seemed to make sense. Okay, that's, that's you know, great. you know, I, I, I think I was, like, I was like, this feels like the most blasphemous thing to say. If I'm going to say it to him, I've got to prove it. I've got to take three pages yeah. of well-researched shit. And you're just like, oh yeah, people matter. Okay, well, I wish I had just asked you that. I wouldn't have had to write this book. At the molecular level, there's an analogy. Is it? You know, we have, we have. Uh, genetic lesions, as we call them, like sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis uh, mutations that lead to terrible diseases that we would like to get rid of. But you know that the heterozyta of these mutations is actually, uh, uh, has more fitness than, the, than our wild type. So someone who has one cystic fibrosis mutation along with the other uh, allele being a wild type has a higher fitness than two wild types. So that goes right along with your principle mm. at, the, uh, at the molecular level, mm. which is the only thing I know anything about. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Lulu and Chris, thank you so much. Um, it was a great conversation, a great book. Um, I can't thank you enough for joining us. And thank you to everyone who tuned in as well. So if you have any additional questions for Lulu or Chris, their emails are up there on the screen. Please feel free to ask them. Log into the Scientist uh, Social Club uh, Facebook group and ask questions there. I just want to mention real quick that our next book club book is titled Real Life, a novel published just last, last month about a young black queer man from Alabama working toward a biochemistry degree and grappling with uh, finding his way in the world. I'm also delighted to relay that author Brandon Taylor will be joining us for a webinar like this to discuss the book sometime in late May. Stay tuned to the Scientist Facebook um, group, the, the Social Club, for more information on that. And once again, thank you, everyone, uh, especially Chris, uh, you and Lulu. Um, and I think this was a great discussion, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Bob. Thanks, Dad. Right. Take care. Bye. You still there, Chris? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you.